Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure, uh, really great pleasure. Uh, and I, I took this opportunity to speak to a group that's, that's much more interdisciplinary than usual, and in particular where the math and physics side and the biology side uh, come together. I'm not you know, a mathematician, a physicist, or a biologist. Um, but I, I thought uh, it was an opportunity to consider how the kind of work that I and our whole field is doing really represents a very interesting set of case studies in the intersection between math and science. Um, let me start off by talking about the kind of math that very broadly we're interested in. It's, it's, you know, there, there are many different theoretical perspectives in our field of trying to understand the mind and the brain, um, but I'd say a, a pretty basic shared assumption is that the mind and the brain is some kind of a computer, and the question is, what kind is it? Or at least, that doesn't, that doesn't mean to say that, that that exhausts everything interesting about the mind and the brain. But of all the different ways to understand functionally the mind and the brain, the idea of a computer has just been by far the most scientifically productive of anyone. But what actually you know, are the different kinds of paradigms here? Um, so here are, here are a few that have been proposed over the years, and I would, you know, the years I'm talking about are basically starting with the foundations of the scientific study of intelligence as computation, which you could date to you know, sort of Turing in some sense. Um, maybe you could go back to Boole. Um, as a you know a sort of formal computational proto computational uh, study of the mind, um, but then you know mostly we're talking about the fields of cognitive science, artificial intelligence, neuroscience that kind of grew up together in the 50s, 60s, and up until here. So here are you know five uh, kinds of computers in a sense, and they go along with different kinds of math. So maybe the mind brain is is a logic engine, right? Uh, maybe it's a probability engine. Those are two of the most popular ideas. Um, closely related, but, maybe, but a little bit different, is it is it a, a kind of a statistical learning engine. Uh, maybe it's some kind of high-dimensional vector processor. Maybe it's some kind of complex dynamical system, some nonlinear some nonlinear dynamics. And these are, you know, these are these are paradigms that have each of them has been somewhat successful. I think it's pretty fair to say we don't actually understand how the mind or the brain work. <laughs> and so none of them have been really successful, period. Um, but they've each contributed something. And I think in particular what they've contributed has to, has, has to do with sort of understanding, understanding how the pieces might fit together. And a lot of the most interesting math comes at the interfaces. I just, again, thinking of talking about physicists and mathematicians, not just biologists, um, I wanted to draw a couple of lessons from the long history of interplay between the mathematics and the sciences, uh, you know, particularly the, over the couple of hundred years in, that we've seen that in physical sciences. So here are three things, again, I, I hope these aren't unobjectionable. But three lessons at least I draw from, from the, the history of math and physics. Um, one is that our models are always wrong, but they get better, and the quest to improve them leads to new and deep mathematics. Math is often most useful and interesting at the interfaces, either interfaces across different scales or across different domains. So, for example, the math of statistical mechanics is something that maybe started off trying to glue together the thermodynamic level, you know, that chemists were studying, the properties of temperature, heat, uh, volume, pressure, and so on, to the more molecular and then down to the quantum scale below. Uh, but, the, but, the, but that same kind of math then turns to be useful in all sorts of other things, like understanding um, how, you know, social structures and economic systems. Or string theory, right? where you can argue, and there's a lot of argument, argument, of course, about its value as a physical theory, but there's a very interesting deep uh, set of mathematics there, nobody, see, nobody really questions that, that came from trying to glue together the cosmological scale where gravity is the main force with the quantum scale. And then that same kind of math now people are using to, say, try to glue together scales of analysis in <coughs> dense matter theory, for example. And the third point is that progress is generally reductionist. Right? I mean, reductionist can be a, can be a, I guess you can throw it around as a nasty word, but you know, it's mostly a positive thing. Uh, we make progress by understanding phenomena at a more macro level, and then trying to dig down deeper to the, the more fine-grained mechanisms that give rise to those phenomena. Um, and it, I think a key point is that the way reduction has worked in the physical sciences has math at the, at the, at the center. It's not the phenomena at a higher level that get reduced to phenomena or empirical results at a lower level. It's the math. So it's the math of thermodynamics you know, expressed in ideal gas laws or su such things that gets reduced to the math of, you know, via statistics, the math of what's going on at the molecular or the quantum level, right? Um, and, and I think th th all of these things are going to be lessons for us uh, in trying to understand how the mind and brain work. So here's the outline for this talk, which basically has sort of three parallel points paralleling those lessons uh, drawn from the physical sciences. I'm going to try to give an overview of some of the interesting math that's come about from trying to understand 
uh, intelligence very, very broadly. And talk really focus on three case studies, two that I would call successes, one that's like a very well-recognized success that's, that you know, has emerged over decades. Um, that's this idea of probabilistic inference as a particular kind of math that, that bridges across all the different areas of cognition, really. It bridges the cognitive or the mind level to the, to the brain level. It's provided a paradigm for, for linking up those, those different levels. Um, and also uh, bridging to the sort of the more artificial intelligence side. It's basically the, the basis of, of uh, the best working AI type technologies, which are starting to actually show up in our daily lives at this point. Um, the second case study is, is much newer, um, it, which is this idea of what are called probabilistic programs, and I'll try to give you a flavor for those, which is a kind of math that, that marries the, the insights of probabilistic inference with some ideas which were important in earlier, often seen as less successful eras of uh, cognitive science, AI, neuroscience, more sort of logic, symbolic paradigm. But what, what I think we and others have come to realize is that the probabilistic inference is very powerful, but it, you know, in, in under, unifying across different areas of cognition, unifying the mind and brain level, but the hardest, deepest uh, topics, the things that Jerry was referring to, like our, our real common sense knowledge of the world, can't just be reduced to those terms. It requires the math of logic, symbols, and so on. And so we need to understand, if we really want to get the mind right, we have to understand how to marry probabilistic inference with symbolic, logical paradigms for computation. And then the hardest open question, um, if, we've, if we've actually got a paradigm for getting the, the, the math of the mind right, how do we bring that down to the brain? How we, we, we understand, as I'll tell you, something about how probability can be implemented as a computational paradigm all the way down. Starting to understand that. But the math of logic and symbols is mostly a mystery at this point, at the level of the brain. But there's some really interesting, I think, open questions in, in new math there, actually. And although I, I don't really want to argue this point, but we can if we want, I think that progress is, um, and this is, a bit, I would say this is a personal perspective, like a lot of my more wet neuroscience <laughs> colleagues might disagree with this. But I think that just as in physics, but even more so, the progress here in, in using math to understand the system of interest is likely to be even more sort of top-down and reductionist um, than it has been in physics. That is, it's even more likely that we're going to have success by just using math to describe the high-level macro phenomena of cognition and then reducing those down to neural mechanisms, uh, partly because that's just always how it's worked out most successfully. It's just what, where our intuitions naturally flow. But also because the mind and the brain, unlike, say, you know, a gas or the universe, as far as we know, is a designed system. Right? Evolution has, has engineered the mind and the brain to achieve some function. And that function is, is selected for design primarily at the, at the macro level, the level of which the mind guides behavior. So there's, in some sense, this, this, there's strong design constraints that are coming in that top-down direction um, that you don't have, you, as our, you know, our best scientific understanding, in something like a gas or a, a, a galaxy. Um, it's, that's not to say there aren't important bottom-up constraints also. The hardware of the, of the brain and biology and genes definitely provides design constraints. So I don't want to say that there's a I mean, there's definitely room, and it's absolutely essential to have top-down and bottom-up approaches meeting each other. But I think where math is going to be most useful is coming in this top-down direction. Okay? So let me um, dig into this a little bit more. Um, the, uh, if, if, we're, if we're interested in reverse engineering a system like the brain, you know, it's worth asking how it's different from other complex organs in biology like the liver, you know, why did we have a, a decade of the brain and then some people think we're having a decade of the mind, but we didn't have a decade of the liver? Well, the, 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 you have to think about the function, right? The function of the system. The, the, what the brain does is it's an organ of intelligence. We have to understand what that is. And if you were to try this sort of more bottom-up approach to reverse engineering, many people think about reverse engineering as like something where you start with circuits. Uh, it's, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that it's just never going to work. <laughs> um, you know, here's a, here's a machine that's, that's not a brain, it's a tinker toy computer. Does anybody know what this does? I mean, you might, if you've seen it before, you might know. Anybody know what this machine does? It's a bunch of little wooden sticks and strings. Um, it plays tic-tac-toe. Once you know that, you can kind of see the little three by three interface there. But if you didn't know that it plays tic-tac-toe, or the logic of tic-tac-toe that we all learned as kids, right, it's sort of illustrated in this game tree, uh, the basic logic that once you grasp it, you can, you can all either win or always at least play to a time. That logic is implemented in this machine, but if you didn't understand the idea of a game tree and that algorithm, I, I, I would venture to say you'd never be able to just study the wiring diagram and figure out how this thing works. So 
we want to start with the functional level. What is, what is intelligence really? Now again, there are many takes on this, but the approach that I think is, is very broadly shared across the field, certainly in, in cognitive science, is something that it has its roots in the, the Latin root. Uh, intel intelligence basically means, and it uh, comes from intelligere, which means to understand, right? When we talk about, think about, um, uh, you know, what's a, what's a good test of what you've learned in a college class that we that we all took or taught? You know, you want a good test is a test that really tests your deep understanding, not just your rote memorization of facts, but your ability to take the abstract knowledge that you've learned and apply it in new situations. And that's at the heart of all the things in intelligence that we're interested in: the ability to build models that actually understand the world and generalize beyond the specific data that you have. And that's, that's a, a, a notion of intelligence that shows up in perception, reasoning, learning, decision-making, planning. It's that idea of the mind and the brain as a model-building <coughs> system with generalization beyond experience. So one, one way to evaluate these different mathematical paradigms is to think, well, to what extent do they help solve this kind of problem? Now, the earliest mathematical approaches which go along with this idea of viewing the mind and the brain as some kind of logic engine, really emphasize just certain aspects of discrete math. The math of symbols, logic, grammars, in computer science, uh, programming languages like Lisp. So just to sort of illustrate this a little bit, um, linguistics and the, the scientific study of language, you know, most famously pioneered by Noam Chomsky and others, really highlighted these kinds of principles of, of paradigms of computation. Here's a, a very simple grammar for a fragment of English. It's a set of rules that take certain kinds of symbols which describe abstract uh, linguistic structures like the notion of a sentence or a noun phrase or a verb phrase. That's this NP and BP. And these rules say, well, how can, here's, how, here's a way to take some of these symbols, rewrite them in terms of other symbols, and thus derive syntactic structures, you know, uh, combinations of phrases and phrases embedded in other, inside other phrases. That was uh, very influential in describing the structure of language, but also to psychologists, people who wanted to study the cognitive basis of, uh, of language. So this is a, a picture from the first textbook on cognitive psychology by Ulrich Messer, in which he was he organized the whole book really around this sort of idea. This is this is just taking a sentence. Uh, it's hard to read here. The rug covered the platform, and showing how the abstract structure. Uh, it's built in terms of a noun phrase and a verb phrase, and that verb phrase covering the platform has a noun phrase embedded inside it. How you can describe that formally in terms of this, this sort of theory of a very simple kind of grammar, what's called a context-free grammar. And why, why was this a powerful kind of mathematics? Why did people find this kind of description compelling? Well, it captured something that, that seemed to be essential in language and also intelligence more generally. Um, what uh, Chomsky famously called, referring to, to some earlier writers, the infinite use of finite means. So we can take a sentence like this and, and understand it, the rug covered the platform, but we can use our knowledge of language to produce or understand all sorts of much more complex sentences, like the rug covering the platform was covered in dust. Or I thought that the rug covering the platform was covered in dust, but it was actually covered in silver. We can keep going. There's an infinite number of more and more complex sentences with structures embedded inside other structures. I thought that the rug covering the platform was covered in dust, but it was actually covered in the ground up bodily remains of hundreds of thousands of tiny coral like organisms who lived millions of years ago at the bottom of an ocean that has long since disappeared, except in the thoughts of certain geologists who remember it all too well. Right, you've never heard that sentence. It's kind of, you know, something I just made up. <laughs> but you had no problem understanding it, right? <laughs> um, so that's, it's that kind of phenomenon that seems to be at the heart of intelligence and systems of rules that can generate this infinite array of new structures following the same basic abstract knowledge seems at the heart of how we do it. Now, more generally outside of language, the symbolic paradigm of computation was influential you know, in vision and building reasoning systems. This is a figure from David Marr's uh, book on vision, sort of the, the pioneering work on computational vision. Um, over here on the right is from the Meissen expert system, which was one of the first uh, influential medical expert systems. And in both of these uh, programs basically are written in a language called Lisp. Just curious, how many people know what Lisp is? How many people have used Lisp? Okay, it's basically the same. Because once you know it, it's so beautiful, of course, you want to use it. Or maybe you never learned it unless somebody made you use it. All right, so Lisp, to most uh, people who don't know it, looks like a bunch of parentheses. You can see a lot of parentheses there. Um, it's a computational formalism of, um, based on actually some underlying mathematics uh, that, that comes out of the field of logic, 
no, what's called the lambda calculus. Now, how many people have heard of the lambda calculus? Okay, um, a little bit more. So, lambda calculus was the invention of, of Alonzo Church. It's it's um, you know uh, Church and the lambda calculus are closely associated with more famous uh, figure Alan Turing and the Turing machine. The lambda calculus and the, and the so-called Turing machine were both mathematical formalisms uh, for describing the notion of computation, right? And a great insight that uh, that Church and Turing and others had was that these and, and maybe some other systems were computationally universal. E e they, they were a kind of math that could describe anything we might mean by a computation and equivalent. The lambda calculus is less famous than Turing machines, but in some ways I think it's more important mathematics for, certainly for intelligence, because it looks a lot more like a programming language. And I'm not going to really tell you about the lambda calculus here, um, except to say that it's extremely deep <laughs> and elegant beautiful, and really provided the foundations for computer science being a mathematical subject. So much of, if not all, of theoretical computer science became possible as an area of mathematics because people like Church and Turing had formalisms for describing the very notion of computation in math. And, and I think of this as it's kind of like case study zero um, of a great success. Uh, it's maybe not often thought of as the math intelligence, but basically that's what it is. Um, and then Lisp and other kinds of programming languages embed that mathematics in a form that can actually be implemented to do, to do useful things, to take in data, process it, produce output, guide behavior. There, is a, there are things called, um, well, Lisp machines, which is a kind of computer that directly takes these expressions in, a, in Lisp, a computational version of lambda calculus, and implements it in circuits. Uh, but really that's what any computer does, is it basically takes this math and compiles it down to some kind of finite circuit that is not exactly a brain, but brain-like. It's a machine that guides intelligence. Now, this, so this is very elegant, but as a paradigm for engineering or reverse engineering intelligence, you know, understanding how the mind works as a, as a quantitative science or building robots, it didn't work very well. <laughs> um, the early days of AI, based on these kinds of programs, were considered a failure. Um, similarly, while it was, you know, while these ideas from grammars and symbolic rules and so on were very important in understanding cognition, it didn't lead to the kind of quantitatively testable, like obviously successful mathematical models that we've seen in the physical sciences or in other areas of biology, right? And so to the point that many people who study language <coughs> these days are totally uninterested in grammars. <laughs> many people who study vision you know, in neuroscience are totally uninterested in programs like this because they don't see how it's going to contact with empirical data. It doesn't explain rich quantitative uh, phenomena that they can measure. And that, that, that's not to say that's the only thing a scientific theory should do, but it's certainly um, a sign of progress and I think it is a way to understand it. It's also not at all clear how this sort of math would relate to the brain. So we need something else. And th this, is, this brings me to the first successful case study, I would say, which is this idea that, that came in, sort of came to fill the vacuum, or maybe you could say that it overthrew the logical symbolic paradigm for understanding intelligence starting around the mid-1980s. Um, if you've heard of neural networks, that was a, that was a kind of paradigm for um, uh, you know, an instance of this <laughs> idea, which was basically replacing the, the paradigm of, of symbols and logic with certain kind of numerical mathematics that we could call now statistics, right? At the time, people didn't necessarily see neural network models as basically statistics engines, but that's pretty much what they were these days. They also had something maybe to do with neurons. But this idea of seeing intelligence as, as a sort of massive data enterprise, data is coming in through your senses, uh, your, your, your retina, your cochlea, uh, and it's processed some way in the brain to guide behavior. And what intelligence is about is finding structure in data, taking this high dimensional flux of, of numbers and finding correlations, clusters. That, you know, that's, that's another sense of this, this notion of intelligence, of finding abstract knowledge that you can exploit to go beyond the data given. Any one of those data points could be you know, an image of your grandmother, to cite Jerry's example, or a, a, a horse that a child is learning what the word horse means or something. Um, but what you need is some kind of structure that can generalize beyond the particular data that you see, like that line or those clusters. Statistics is another way to describe abstract structure. And the math of statistics uh, from data has been extremely successful, at, I think, at this point, we would say, both on the engineering side and on the reverse engineering side. So we have technologies like face detection, pedestrian detection, which are now appearing in things you can buy, cameras, cars. Um, we have 
you know, and, and, and these are these are real successes of taking something that is a is a kind of uh, human-like intelligence and putting it into a machine, or maybe most um, famously things like IBM's Watson system. So probably, uh, who hasn't heard of uh, IBM's Jeopardy Play computer? Right? Um, so things like that, and I, I have to put Google up there too. Um, are real AI successes, right? If you had said to Alan Turing or any of the founders of AI that you had a system that could do, that could, you know, take a, a sentence, a question in, in English or in Jeopardy's funny kind of English and answer it pretty much on any topic by searching all the world's knowledge, like the web or whatever has been mined from the web, extracted, put into Watson's mind, and do that at, uh, you know, a, a, a level of expertise that's even remotely human-like, not to mention meeting expert-level human performance. Uh, in Jeopardy. No, that's clearly some, some kind of AI success. These systems also, I think it's fair to say, are not actually intelligent, right? And we'll come back to what they're missing. But as far as they go, they're a success. And this, this same mathematics has been extremely successful on the more science side, on the cognitive and neuroscience side. So for, for people like me working in cognitive science, many, many of us, I'm, you know, this is one of the things I'm, I'm known for, but there's many people in uh, cognitive science who've used the math of statistics, probabilistic inference, I, I particularly have been interested in Bayesian inference, and I'll say a little bit more about that specifically on, starting on the next slide. But this kind of math has been just hugely successful across all the different areas of cognition. And, and successful here, I, I mean building models that, that are rigorous, explanatory, and quantitatively testable. They engage richly with the data in ways that experimentalists recognize, which in, in, in ways that these more symbolic logic models didn't particularly. And it happens to be basically the same math that's underlying these AI technologies. That's a that's a striking kind of unification there too. So, yeah. Are you thinking about it? Yeah. Um, sure. Um, on the you made two statements that I have to disagree with. Okay. One is that um, you implied that simple manipulation doesn't play a role in contemporary natural language processing. Oh. Well, I'm not. telling a story. I mean, yes, <laughs> I agree with that. I mean, and, and I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't well, so I certainly wouldn't have said that. I said that many people, to their, um, to their uh, loss in psycholinguistics, ignore grammars, right? <laughs> many of them think that grammar formalisms from linguistics, I mean, you have, you have, we'd all have to agree with this, I think that those are kind of irrelevant for understanding the empirical phenomena of psychologists. The ones who are, go back to the last yeah. bit. Uh, the ones like Google and so forth yeah. that are actually doing, say, machine translation yes. are all using the symbol stuff as well as the. the oh yeah. Stuff. I'll just say one more sentence, mm -hmm. which is what I wanted to say about yeah. Watson. So if you look at how Watson actually works, there's plenty of symbol manipulation in there as well as lots of. Symbols. Oh yes, yes, that, that that is certainly true. I agree with that, and that's more. I mean, that, that's sort of more of the moral of the story where I'm going to come back to. But if you ask people why didn't those things work before and why do they now work, <coughs> you see. But people, I mean, and again, the, a lot of this is, is mythology, which I think we would both agree. But but um, but you see people blaming the early, blaming the fact that you know symbols without numbers weren't any good; they were brittle. They that you had to wire everything in, whereas we need things that can learn. So it's it's the addition of the statistics that's seen as the actual source of the success, right? I'm totally having the same yeah. addition of the statistics yeah. made a huge difference. For example, in Watson, well, um, which relies on the but it's not just, but okay. The symbols are really important too. I'm, so I totally agree. But there is also, again, part, it's part of the, I don't know, mythology or conventional wisdom or stupidity of the field, that it's, it's the data and statistics that do most of the work. So it's Jelinek, right, who's famous for saying, every time I fire a linguist, my system improves, right? Or Fernando Pereira, one of the leading computational linguists who you know, left academia after being, I think, head of the Penn CS department. Well, first of all, being high up in at and then he was at Penn, then he moved to Google basically said, I've spent my career moving down the Chomsky hierarchy, which means starting with really really interesting, abstract, rich grammars, and getting to simpler and simpler and stupider grammars, but adding more data and statistics, and it works better. So, you know, I'm not saying that that is the, is, I mean, I think that's, a, that's a, those are um, dangerous ideas, it's mythology, yeah, but, it, but I'm telling a story. And part of what I want to argue here is how we can actually reverse some of that and see that uh, to really get an intelligence, you're going to need all of that richness of the early days of logic and symbols combined with, with this. But, this, but certainly the, the story that computer scientists will tell you, the ones who have been most successful in, in, in the practical world, is do more with statistics, more with data, less with grammar, symbols, rules, and so on, and you'll be better off. Okay. Um, but I think we basically agree that uh, 
that's a story. But people who yeah. know Watson don't actually believe in mythology, right? They, they're much more yeah, eclectic. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Yes, yeah. that's true. Do they include temporal reasoning, for example, that's purely symbolic logic? Just like one example. Uh, yes, that's true. And they're trying to do more, right? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, the, uh, one of the things I'll talk about in a little bit, in fact, really going on to the next slide, is causal reasoning, which is a, sort of a related to statistical reasoning, but deeper, very central to human reasoning. Watson didn't do any causal reasoning, but I know that they wanted to go in that direction because they hired a student who wasn't one of my students, but I was on his committee. He did a PhD thesis in the cognitive science of causal reasoning, and the Watson team hired him. So, right, the people who are, who are building those systems um, know they need to move more and more in the direction that I'm talking about. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, how many people find this ba you know, sort of recognized Bayes rule at this level? Okay. Um, just to get us all on the same page, I'm just going to go through this very quickly as a very uh, sort of intuitive, simple illustration of the concepts behind a particular kind of statistical inference that was, that's guided a lot of what, what I've done. Um, so what we're doing in Bayesian inference is we're taking in data and coming up with hypotheses that you can use to interpret the data. And those hypotheses are going to be scored in terms of a kind of conditional probability, that posterior probability, P of H given B, in terms of two other kinds of probabilities, the priors, P of H, and P of, a, P of D given H, what's called the likelihood for the hypothesis, which is how well does it predict that particular data. And the score, you take that joint score of prior times likelihood and you compute that relative to the sum of those joint probabilities over all hypotheses that you're going to consider, and that's what makes a good explanation. That's what makes a hypothesis that scores high in the posterior probability. Okay. So this is a kind of math that's been around for several hundred years, and in some sense, making this, scaling this up um, and applying this to everyday reasoning, that's, that's, that's where this math needs intelligence. So to see this on a, a sort of familiar example, again, not with numbers, but just informally and intuitively, um, let's say the data is that our friend John is coughing, and we have some hypotheses. He could have a cold, he could have lung cancer, he could have a stomach flu. Three hypotheses that could explain the data. Well, intuitively, it's having a cold that's by far the most compelling uh, explanation, unless we had some other source of information. And Bayes says the reason for that is that one factor, the likelihood, favors one and two over three. So colds and lung cancers um, raise the probability of the data above the typical value. So they make the P of D given H high for those two H's. And intuitively, we could say that's because we know they cause it. But Bayes doesn't have to have that causality in it. That's just intuitively where we might get those, those conditional probabilities in the likelihood. Um, whereas stomach flu doesn't, doesn't cause uh, coughing, so it doesn't raise its probability. The priors, on the other hand, favor 1 and 3 over 2. Right? So colds and stomach flu are common. Lung cancer is thankfully relatively rare. So it has a low prior probability, you know, independent of any data, just what's, what's its base rate. And then you, you combine those two together to get the joint score, and only hypothesis one scores highly. So that's why, according to Bayes, hypothesis one is the best answer. Now, we're not saying that when you see your friend coughing and think, oh, he's got a cold, let me you know, stay away, um, that you've explicitly enumerated a list of hypotheses and scored them in this way, only that you do some kind of computation which follows this logic. And I'll say more in a little bit about what you might actually be doing to come up with a, a high-scoring hypothesis according to Bayes' rule. But what I first want to do is show you how you use this math to actually describe richly behavior. So here's one, ex just one example. I mean, there's you know, hundreds of experiments like this, but I'll just give you one that, that I did together with Tom Griffiths. Um, he was a grad student working with me. Um, it's an it's example of a kind of textbook application of some Bayesian statistics ideas, but in an everyday intuitive setting. So we gave people problems like this. You read about a movie that's made $60 million to date. How much will it make in total? Or you see that something's been baking in the oven for 34 minutes. How long until it's ready? You meet someone who's 78 years old, how long will they live? Your friend quotes to you from line 17 of his favorite poem, how long is the poem? You meet a US congressman who served for 11 years, how long will he serve in total? So these are all examples of taking in one bit of data and going beyond it to make a prediction, or some kind of generalization. But they all have a very simple mathematical form. You encounter a phenomenon or event with some unknown total extent of duration, call that t total. You get one sample, t, which all you know is that it's less than t total, greater than zero and less than t total and you have to make a guess at t total. So Bayes gives you some math for doing that. It says the first thing you need is, is, is a prior. You need to know what's the, the, the baseline distribution of these extensive durations for this class of events. And we can go and measure those. The, the, what's shown on the top are measurements from publicly available data for these <coughs> different classes of everyday events. And then that, that's, there's, there's the sort of empirical histogram measurement, and then there's the, um, the red 
uh, curve fits, which are just the fit in some whatever the closest simple parametric family is, like a Gaussian or a gamma distribution or a power law distribution. That's all data you can measure in the world. The bottom is data from an experiment that we did. So that's I'm going to talk about this in a second about how uh, by applying the, the logic of Bayesian inference to the to the data on the top, we can predict what people will do with the data on the bottom. But just just to be clear here, what's interesting? One of the things that's interesting about this problem is that the priors measured from empirical statistics are qualitatively different for these different classes of events. So some of them, like movie grosses and poems, have a power law distribution. Right? Most movies don't make very much money, but there's a few blockbusters. Most poems are you know, short, like sonnets or haiku, and there's a few epic Odyssey-type poems. Um, some of them, like lifespans and movie runtimes, have close to a Gaussian distribution, normal distribution. The distribution of, of um, representatives serving times is a, a certain kind of gamma distribution, in particular an Erlang distribution. Um, and then you have things like cake baking times, which don't follow any simple parametric form, kind of this funny, bumpy thing where you've got this um, you know, big but sharp spike at, at 60 minutes, a lot of cakes take an hour. There's a broader mode around 45 minutes, and then there's a few epic 90-minute cakes out there on the right. <laughs> um, and for each of these different distributions, you can apply Bayes rule to compute a posterior distribution and then a, a, what's called a posterior pr uh, predictive estimate. So you have to take, you, you, you take these, this prior, you condition on the value being at least as much as the thing you observe, and then you make some, you update the distribution, make some guess, which the standard textbook solution is what's called the posterior median. So we take the median, the 50th percentile of the posterior distribution, and we say that's our guess, that where the, our probability is 50-50, that, that the truth is above or below that. And what's shown here on the bottom are, um, well, the, the five black dots in each plot are the medians of human subjects who answered questions of this form, but in five different groups where they were given different numbers. So here are, you know, some, some subjects might have read about a movie that's read 60, made $60 million a day, but others maybe saw $30 million or $15 million or $100 million. And then each of those groups of subjects made a guess, and we plotted their median guesses. So it's the, the x-axis is the number they were given, and then their guess is along the y-axis. And then we're showing the model fits, which, is, which are the medians of the posterior predictive distribution from this Bayesian analysis, using the priors on the top for each of those domains. And the one thing you should take from this is that it fits pretty well, both quantitatively and qualitatively. So there, the, the, the different shapes of these Wait, the model predictions. Fits the, the black uh, or the red? Uh, the, those are two. Those are two different versions. The black is the, using the empirical histogram prior, and the red is using the simple fit. So that's why for the cakes over there, where there's no simple um, fit, it's just this bumpy empirical distribution. But even there, it fits pretty well, right? So the the, the take home from this is sim and there's there's subtleties to this experiment, which I'll talk about later, depending on if we have time. But the take home is that it fits both quantitatively, but also that there's these qualitatively different shapes of the prediction function, which come from the qualitatively different shapes of the prior. And that seems to also correspond to what people have. So it's as if people are, are sort of not only making the optimal inferences, but tuned to the right statistics of the world. The subjects were mathematicians. The subjects were, no, they were students in the Stanford introductory psychology. And this kind of thing has been replicated with lots of people. I mean, because some people don't believe this, so they did their own version. <laughs> okay. Um, in Matheson, famously always wrong about this. Um, I'm not sure what you mean, but they're, they're, like famously wrong about these sorts of things, or that they, I mean, it's, an inter it's interesting that you can give people very simple probability puzzles, like the Monty Hall problem, for example, or other things, which people find counterintuitive. And it's also interesting that you can give people things like this, which is you know a textbook problem from somewhere in the middle of a typical Bayesian statistics graduate textbook, and they find it very intuitive. So it's I, I mean there there is a kind of a again a conventional wisdom mythology that I think is just as wrong as the one Gary was pointing to, which is that people aren't good at statistics or our brains aren't wired for statistics or something like that. Well, it's interesting that certain kinds of basic ideas in probability theory are counterintuitive, but others. Other things that, that, in, that from a mathematical point of view are much more advanced are not only are intuitive, but I think are at the heart of our intuitions. Is, I, don't, is that, I don't know if that addresses what you're, what you're saying. Um, I'm saying there's a mountain of data how we measure the, 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 at the most elementary Yeah, but isn't no, it but interesting? No, that's a different thing because there's all sorts of emotional stuff and, and not, wishes uh, and, and stuff and going on. This is just a new film. Well, and, and the dynamics. The there's nothing that they would do. So, so, so to avoid, to avoid, to avoid um, getting into a discussion just about that, although we could, um, um, let me say something which I think will maybe be a little bit um, uh, Maybe, same, maybe strikes you as, as, as more moderate. Um, 
I'm not trying to say that the brain or the mind is some kind of general statistics engine or probability engine or that anything that, that uh, you can do, uh, the, you know, any, any, any problem in a probab probability or statistics textbook, you can just give someone in words and they'll be able to solve it, right? What, or, or that there's even necessarily any form you can give that problem to people. But what I want to say, and what I think there's a mountain of data for, which, you know, I'm not sure what your field is, but I'll put my mountain of data next to anybody else's mountain of data and we can <laughs> duke it out. There's a mountain of data that shows that the things that the brain is good at, it's not good at a lot of math. It's, I mean, the, by the brain, I mean the brain that we all have, not just those of us who are mathematicians, but any young child even, right? Or, or anybody who grows up in a culture that doesn't have any sort of advanced technology or advanced mathematics. They're, the things that the brain, as a piece of biology, is good at, perceiving the world through vision, understanding language, the stuff you're doing right now, trying to understand what words mean, what people mean by their actions, all the stuff I'm going to show you, making predictions, planning, you know, planning motor actions, those things that the brain is good at, evolved to solve, those problems, the math of probability theory has a lot to say about, quantitatively and explanatorily. Notwithstanding whether they are mathematicians or not, they, they should, you know, I don't know if the average person knows this uh, fitting of, you know, the difference between yeah. the run times and yeah. lifespan. Right. I mean, notice we didn't ask people to make a probability judgment. We just said, you read about a movie that's made $6 million today, how much do you think it'll make in total? I don't know, maybe $100 million. Right. But They're you just claimed it in the yeah. intuition, they knew this, this uh, fitting. Um, at least approximately, yeah. Okay. Um, but rather than dwell on that example, I want to go to harder problems. Right, because that that those problems are already are still too simple. Right, the the math that, to describe them is just you know one one uh, variable, right, and the statistics relevant for it, the priors are things you know you might say well isn't it amazing or is, is it is it a remarkable claim that people somehow have an approximate knowledge of those distributions? But they're not that hard to measure. I mean we can measure them from the web, but we have you know these are these numbers are available to us in our society in our lives. But take other kinds of settings where you might want to make inferences that go beyond the data, where it's not even clear necessarily how you describe that prior knowledge or how people might get it. So let's go back to the medical diagnosis sort of example and say, okay, here's a bunch of sort of everyday medical reasoning things, which in a principle you could apply Bayes' rule to. Um, we, so we, we said, what happens if, you know, what do we, how, how do we interpret the finding that John is coughing? We might think he has a cold or maybe he could have other things. But, you know, consider all the different kinds of data that you might observe. You know, uh, suppose we observe that John is coughing, has a runny nose, and a headache. Okay, well that makes it probably more likely that he has a cold. Um, but suppose he is coughing, has a fever, and chest pain. Well, maybe, I don't know, now what would you say he has? What's... Pneumonia. Pneumonia? <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe. Um, right. Um, John's coughing, has chest pain, and is spitting up blood. What would you say? TV, TV maybe, yeah. Um, John is 56 and a lifelong smoker. And coughing. You can add these things. What? Something else. Okay. What do you think? Cancer, maybe long enough. So, yeah. uh, John is 11, and two of his classmates recently had pneumonia. Okay, now pneumonia, but that rests on knowing that pneumonia is an infectious disease. It is contagious. It, it could be contagious, not it's not sexually transmitted, but it's transmitted, you know, through the kind of interaction that kids might have in a, in a classroom. John works as a janitor in the hospital in the infectious diseases ward. What do you think? TB, maybe. Yeah. I mean, again, but we have to use some other knowledge that TB is the kind of infectious disease that you get hospitalized for. John works as a janitor in a nuclear power plant. Yeah, more cancer. Particularly if I said, you know, suppose it's a Russian nuclear power plant. <laughs> no, sorry, no offense to Russians, but I mean. Um, or, you know, and a power plant that recently had a serious incident or something. Um, John just came, sorry, I'm, I'm really taking up Russia a lot, sorry. John just came back from a trip to Russia where he met with inmates in several prisons. TB, yeah. How do you know that? Why did you say that? You, you, you have to use some other knowledge that, I mean, part, right, okay, right, but, but, you know, part of the point is you have to know that TB is endemic in Russian prisons, right? The worst thing about going to prison, prison in Russia is, is, you know, that, probably. Okay. Um, as a hobby, John is secretly researching at home new forms of deadly airborne respiratory viruses. And I put these things together. Suppose he works as a janitor in a nuclear power plant and he's secretly researching at home new forms of deadly airborne respiratory viruses. You know, what do you think? What do you think he has? And he's coughing. What? A cold. A cold. <laughs> All right. You get the idea. Okay. Um, so how can we take the math of Bayesian statistics and apply it to all of these problems? Well, we can't just go out and measure a bunch of numbers. We need to filter it through some, some kind of a deeper model. And the math that's guided this 
is, I mean, there's, there's different you know, versions of this, but probably the most broadly influential is what's called graphical models, pro uh, probabilistic graphical models. And the most famous ones of these are what are called Bayesian networks, which were that name and, that, and the, the math of Bayesian networks was most developed and promoted by Udaya Pearl. How many people have heard of Udaya Pearl? He's pretty influential at this point. He just won the Turing Award, which is, you know, award for uh, lifetime achievement contribution to computer science. And you get that when you've done work that is not just important for computer science, but for many other fields where computation is relevant. So, you know, I would say, broadly speaking, what's made um, technologies like machine learning, ones that so many people want to be using right now, not just researchers in AI or cognitive science, is this kind of math. At Google, the way they do statistics is, you know, yes, they count up a lot of data, but they filter it through models like these, graphical models, very, you know, million dimensional, if not more, graphical model. So what is a graphical model, in particular this kind of one called the BayesNet, which is built on a directed acyclic graph, so a graph where the, there's no loops in the arrows and they all, the arrows go in one direction. It's a, it's a general language for representing a very complex high dimensional probability distribution, so the joint distributions over all these variables. Right? In order to do this kind of reasoning, you can't just have two variables uh, you know, representing three possible disease states in one symptom, but you have to have a very large number of variables. And the idea is that the, the, the nodes, the circles in the graph represent these random variables, things you could measure or reason about. The arrows represent the d most direct, irreducible probabilistic dependencies, which often have a causal structure. So uh, here's one uh, very standard application of Bayesian networks in medical expert systems, where you have this two-layer bipartite structure with a whole bunch of diseases on top and a bunch of symptoms on the bottom, and then the arrows go from diseases to symptoms, intuitively encoding which which diseases cause which symptoms. And then you put a bunch of numbers on those arrows in ways that aren't really that important. But basically, what you do is you make a table for every effect variable, or every any variable at all, you, have, you look at its parents, its causes, and then you make a table of the probabilities for that variable being present or absent or having some value as a function of all the different states that its parents could take on. And that's what a Bayesian network is. Um, it's, a, it's, 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 it's got a causal interpretation, but it's not you know, a very deep notion of causality. It just says you know, what, what it means for A to cause B is for B to depend in some irreducible way on the state of A. And these numbers can be filled in from learning from experience, or you can wire them in however you want. And then once you have this representation of your, of your knowledge of your brain, how, every, how, you know, what depends on what, you can now do arbitrary inferences with efficient algorithms. So there are algorithms that do what's called conditional inference. It's a generalization of Bayesian inference, where you observe some things and want to know about others. Right? In Bayes' rule, you observe the data and want to know about the hypothesis. But more generally, we could observe any subset of these variables and want to know about any other subset. And what's made this, this, math, this area of math, basically, or this we call it applied math, uh, so powerful is these two things: a, a, a general language for representing complex probability distributions, where there's some notion of causality in there that both makes it intuitive and, and useful for, for people, and these general algorithms for doing probabilistic inference, for conditioning on some things and making inferences about others. And we and many others have used these to model human cognition. And I'm not really going to show you too many of the details. I'll just show you a little bit of some some of the even sort of fancier ways you can go beyond this, this is the kind of thing that was in that article that, that was put out as background reading. Ways to take what you could call this toolkit of computational statistics that has been very useful for thinking about bigger scale problems of intelligence and, and keep pushing it. Um, so for example, one of the things that we did uh, a few years ago, this was one of our main research areas, was to take um, the math of what's called hierarchical Bayes and non-parametric Bayes. These are other ideas that were developed originally by Bayesian statisticians and picked up on in machine learning and then show how to combine those with, say, these causally structured graphical models to get some interesting kinds of learning and reasoning, both on the, the human side and making more human-like AI systems. Just to illustrate how this kind of thing works, this is, there's, I think, a figure more or less like this in the paper. Um, and then I'll go on to some of the more uh, frontier areas that, that were not written up there. So to say, well, how can we take the math so, so the math of, of probabilistic graphical models as it's posed here is not really about learning, it's about reasoning, right? You have this causal knowledge representation and then I'm going to observe some symptoms and make some inferences, right? So it's kind of like medical reasoning. But how might you learn that knowledge? How could you learn causal structure from just observations of data? Or how might, as, as we'll see in a second, in order to learn effectively, there's probably some other background knowledge you have to know and how might you learn that? 
There's a, there, cognitive scientists have long been interested in, in people in machine learning too, in what's called learning to learn. In order to learn effectively, you already have to know something, but could you learn that in, in some kind of sort of turtles or learning all the way up? At least for people interested in learning, that has, all, that has always been a dream of the field and something that it seems like children do. Not only do children learn specific facts, right, but they somehow learn more general kinds of knowledge that, that helps them bootstrap, snowball their learning across many different domains. So here's, here's how you do learning and learning to learn using the hierarchical Bayesian toolkit. Um, the first step is to understand, is to take that Bayesian network and embed it inside, I'm, I know, I, I'm sorry I'm gonna have to move over here to point. Um, so here's, here's the particular causal network. And we might say, how can we learn this by observing patterns of correlation about these different features across um, patients? So we might observe a patient who has you know, chest pain and, and a stressful lifestyle or smoking and coughing. You know, very, here, here I've got various diseases and symptoms and also some kind of excuse me, risky behaviors uh, that might cause this. And I want to learn what causes what from observing different patients. Well, there's a kind of a, a more meta-graphical model here which says the causal structure, whatever it is, this is one possible causal structure, gives rise to these measurable data. And by doing Bayesian inference from this to this, I can, I can learn the causal structure. The hypothesis space here, right, isn't, it's not like interpreting one particular symptoms, patient, uh, patient symptoms where the hypothesis space is, do they have this disease or that disease? Here the hypothesis space is all possible graphs representing all possible networks of causal relations. And then somehow you have to find a high scoring graph or a graph that has high posterior probability given these data. Now that's a very, very hard problem. But you um, already limit yourself to a layer of graph where well, uh, yeah, so you, you, you peeked ahead of my slide. But the, the, the way this is usually formulated in, in AI and machine learning, the so-called problems structure learning and graphical models, is uh, to say, well, let's not assume anything other than that there's, there's some graph, and I want to learn over this. This, you know, for, uh, People in biology might have seen these kinds of tools have been applied in bioinformatics, right, where maybe you're trying to learn a network of protein-protein interactions or gene interaction networks. And you, you want to go in, let's say, you know, not making strong prior assumptions, um, though, as we'll start to see, and this also applies in the bioinformatics things, there might be some important, more abstract knowledge that you know. Um, but suppose you don't, suppose you just think, you know, I don't know, anything could cause anything else. Let me find out. Um, well, the, one way to quantify how hard learning is, is to look at the size of the hypothesis space. The bigger the hypothesis space, the more data you're going to need to narrow things down. And for these directed acyclic graphs, or Bayesian networks, the size of the hypothesis space grows super exponentially in the number of variables. So here there's 12 variables. Anybody know how many directed acyclic graphs there are in 12 variables? It's something like 521 gazillion there. <laughs> that number. Um, that's really ridiculously huge. And it's why there isn't a lot of actually, although you can in principle do this, people don't often try to learn the causal structure from without any prior knowledge. Now this I think is what you maybe were referring to. There's a way to make the problem a lot more solvable, which is to put some high level knowledge up here and say, Suppose we know that there's this layered structure, that the variables can be divided into these three classes, which we call diseases, symptoms, and behaviors. And suppose we know further which variable is which sort. And that suppose we know that the, that the causal arrows tend to go in, in, in this particular pattern. Behaviors cause diseases, diseases cause symptoms, and that's it. Um, and, maybe I, and then the only thing I don't know is which disease causes which symptom, or which behavior causes which disease. So that knowledge really helps. It cuts the hypothesis space down from 521 gazillion to 131,000. And you know, I'll show you, in, I think, on the next slide, unless I cut it out, um, how, how much faster that makes learning. The interesting thing, though, to us was to say, well, OK, so we know that constraining the hypothesis space with that higher level abstract knowledge, and by the way, the reason why I have these arrows in this, and this is sort of what we mean by a hierarchical, a hierarchical Bayesian model is this whole picture is these arrows here also represent conditional distributions. Basically, this puts a prior on graphs, just as the graph puts a distribution on uh, patterns of events. And then Bayesian learning here, if we know that, and if we know, if we observe this, is kind of combining the top down and bottom information to find the graph which best fits that scheme on the top and explains the data. But suppose, you know, like human culture or, or, or children at some point, you didn't have that schema, but you had to learn it, right? Um, could you learn both this and this? And we gave a simple mathematical model for doing that, a kind of hierarchical non-parametric model. The non-parametric part means that 
what we assume at this level is very general, fairly weak knowledge. In a sense, it's, it's an assumption at, a, at, the, at a fourth, highest level uh, of a space of possible causal schemas that's going to allow us to learn both this one and that one at that level. And we just said, suppose the variables can be divided into some number of classes. I don't know how many. Maybe it's one. Maybe they're all in the same class. Maybe they're each in a different class. Maybe it's three, four, 17. I don't know. And I don't know which variable is in which class. And I don't know the, the priors on what tends to cause what. So I don't know which class has tends to have arrows to which other class. But I, but I just know that they somehow divide into classes. Or I believe they somehow divide into classes. But wait, to make this well defined, you mean each class has an arrow to one other class? No, no. So, 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 so the technical. But then why does it limit anything? Well, so there's um, the technical way it works is to say that there's a there's a prob so there's a probability distribution on the partition of variables. So it's really partitions of the integers. And then once you partition them into some infinite but smaller subset, right? Then there's some probability that each class sends er, er, each instance of a class sends an error to each instance of the other class. Those are just like coin flip probabilities. So that's the that's the structure of the model, and it's, it allows for any possible graph, but it does concentrate its probability on some graphs rather than others. So this graph is more likely than some very random arbitrary oh, graph. Oh, so it keeps the same size hypothesis space. It just puts a probability density. It keeps the same. Yeah, it keeps the same size hypothesis space at this level, but it inflates it massively at the higher level because you also have now all possible partitions of variables. So you might think, well, okay, we've increased, we, we've increased the size of the hypothesis space in a sense by putting this up here. Shouldn't learning get harder? It actually gets easier. So this slide shows how much easier it gets. And but we mean by easier is what what uh, is called in learning theory sample complexity. That means the number of data points you need to learn the same amount of stuff. So here's just an illustration of this for now it's a two-layered network. We have something for that three-layered one too, but I just had a slide, a nice slide for the two-layered one. Kind of like this you know, disease symptom network that people study. So this is, this is a synthetic example, but it makes the point. Here's the true network that we're going to be learning from, and it can be represented as this graph or as this matrix here, a connectivity matrix, and you see that there's, there's sort of six diseases and ten symptoms so all the, all the black squares are in this upper right corner, which are connections between the first six variables and the next ten. So that's the ground truth we're going to learn, and we're going to learn it from samples drawn, sample patients drawn from this model. So here we're comparing two approaches to learning. This one up here, the top one, is the more traditional kind of bottom-up learning where we just say, well, it could be any graph, and I'm just going just to um, you know, have, a, have, a, have a basically uniform prior. Um, and then what we're plotting here are the posterior edge marginals. So what's our degree of belief that any one variable causes any other variable, conditioned on seeing 20 cases, 20 examples, 80 examples, 1,000 examples? And what we can see here is that after 1,000 examples that you can successfully learn in this case, you can pretty much get it right. But with, with 80 examples, it's pretty noisy. You can start to see the right answer emerging, but there's a lot of other spurious illusory correlations here. This is the sense in which you know, we know that correlation does not imply causation, because on any sort of small data set here, it's just hard to tell. There's a lot of errors that could go one way or the other. If you have only 20 data points, you know, it's hardly enough to compute a reliable correlation. It's hard to see really anything that's going on. But now, compare what's going on in this model here, where you're learning at both the bottom and the top level. So you're learning this causal schema. You're learning to organize these 16 variables into these two groups. Well, here, what we see is, I, I didn't, I, I'm only showing this schematically, but basically, you're able to figure out the group structure, which, which are the diseases, if you like, which are the symptoms, very quickly, actually from only 20 samples. You can pretty much get it, not perfectly, but you get it perfectly by 80, and as a result, and then you use the, the constraints of what you've learned at that level to learn at this level, or to better condition the distribution at the lower level. With, from 80 samples, you basically learned perfectly and gotten rid of all these illusory correlate, correlations which went, which went against your abstract schema. And even with 20 samples, you've learned something interesting at the bottom level. You don't know what causes what, but you know these things tend to cause those things. You've got that basic block structure that's the sort of the bigger picture. This pattern of learning where, in a sense, you get the big picture first is one that we see across human cognition. It's one of the most interesting things in cognitive development, that the earliest knowledge that children seem to have is actually very abstract knowledge. Um, and then, and, and it's so, much, so much so that many people have argued that, that it might be innate, right? And I'm not saying it isn't. I'm just saying the fact that we see very early emerging abstract knowledge, which is very useful, it constrains the more specific knowledge that children learn, is, is it's both an important part of how human learning works, but it's also, it would be a puzzle for somebody who wanted to 
understand how abstract knowledge itself might be learned. Or in a, you know, if you look at other areas of what you could call learning, like scientific discovery, human scientists often get the big picture first and then fill in the details. You know, you get a paradigm, like in biology, the famous you know, central dogma, right? I mean, it's not that, that, that people were born with that. But well before it, people figured out exactly you know, how RNA, DNA proteins work, or exactly which bit of DNA makes this kind of protein, and so on, the, the, the general idea was in place. And then, having that in place, you can go in and fill in lots of the details. Could, could you repeat, though, what it is that was known in the causal schema? Merely that there was some breakdown of the... Six there was some partition of the variables, which... Which right. they didn't know, I mean, that your the model program did not know. Writer, yes. doesn't know how, whether it's partitioned into one or six. Two or three or four or five or sixteen. But did you give it a prior on that? Basis? There is a prior. It's a very general prior. It's called, uh, it's a thing in probability theory that's called the Chinese restaurant process. It's, it's, um, it's basically just a very, uh, it's almost a flat distribution on partitions of the integers. So it doesn't do that much work. Uh, if, if you want to, if you, it, 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 I, I don't want to pretend that there's magic here. The real, if, if you want to say where is the leverage coming in, yeah. It's coming in in the fact that when you, if you do find yourself with a partition into a small number of classes like this one, it makes a very strong prior because there's only one parameter in, this, in the model to describe the prior on how variables in one class link to variables in another class. Right? There's one coin flip that says how likely that the disease causes a symptom. And that's, a, oh, that's an oversimplification for real diseases. It's not like there's some, you know, our prior knowledge in medicine is much more gen or much richer than just saying there's a 0.3 probability that any given disease causes any given symptom. But, so, so that's, a, that's in a sense, that it's basically a prior that says the causal matrix is block structured and fairly clean if you can find the right blocks. That's where the real leverage is coming. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's that assumption of block structure. The thing I so, told you so far is just describing in a sense like languages for what somebody might know or what we know when we're intelligent, but I haven't said anything about how. How do you search through this space, or how do you actually solve these computational problems? And both on the engineering side and on the scientific side, this is a very hard problem. <laughs> um, so for people who are interested in the computational complexity of probabilistic inference, it's, and you know anything about complexity classes like P and NP, it's worse than NP, it's what's called sharp P. Um, and so one of the things that, that in engineering people have to worry about is if you want to do probabilistic inference on some really large problem, you need to come up with some efficient approximate algorithm. But let's just think about brains and minds, right? How might people actually search through these space hypotheses? Well, or and how might the brain do it? There's, a, there's an influential um, framework in cognitive neuroscience broadly, which is mostly attributed to David Marr, that tries to identify these different levels of analysis for an information processing system. And in Marr's framework, everything I've told you is at the theory level. I've just talked about, you know, what are the inputs, what's the, what are the outputs of a, of a learning or inference problem, and what kind of knowledge makes it happen. But I haven't told you what algorithms can be used to compute these answers. I've just shown you some results. Right? And then there's the, the lower, lower level of the hardware, which you know, can either be in machine circuits or brain circuits. The traditional levels of cognitive psychology is, is here, and the traditional level of the most neuroscience is at this level. Now, one of the most intriguing um, things, and again, to me, this is sort of the height of this, this uh, success, the most successful case study, is taking the math, very generally, of probabilistic inference and showing how it can be um, carried through all these levels. Both, uh, we're starting to see that in the mind and brain and also on the computer science side. So here's a picture which is only meant to be evocative. Um, everything I talked about so far is up here, right? Just the math of Bayesian inference and Bayesian networks. But on the engineering side, again, drawing on work in statistics and originally in statistical physics, um, there's been a lot of success in coming up with uh, Monte Carlo randomized algorithms for approximate Bayesian inference on large scale problems. That includes things like um, MCMC, markup chain Monte Carlo, uh, particle filtering, important sampling, various kinds of Monte Carlo methods, um, which, you know, again, uh, just have a lot of engineering value. These, these, this is one way to do, not the only way, but one way to do scalable, approximate probabilistic inference. Um, but what's, what's one of the things that's exciting is that there's, there's evidence that if you look at human behavior, the way people are actually responding, I'll show you a little bit of this in a, in a second, um, looks like their actual moment-to-moment -moment responses or their their hypotheses and the learning problem 
are actually um, look very much like samples for the distribution. So, it's, so if you know something about Monte Carlo approximate uh, inference, it seems to not only be a good idea as an engineering thing, it seems to actually describe what people do on a on a moment-to-moment -moment online basis. And then most speculatively uh, is the mapping of these kinds of sampling-based approximate inference schemes down to the hardware level, either in the brain or in neural circuits. So this is just from some work of Joseph Fisher and colleagues who argued, you know, I think rather speculatively, but interestingly, that if you look at spiking in neurons, and I think they were looking at a ferret, and you look at both spontaneous, you know, spiking when the thing is just looking at nothing, like in the dark, and then you look at evoked activity when you show them a stimulus, that it seems to have the character of samples from a prior that get updated to a posterior. Um, yes, go ahead. Um, actually, we were talking about phase two, one of the things that came back. I worked yes. in yes. <laughs> the part of the physical comment. Right. So do you, uh, by you I mean the people who work in yes. this field, do you use dynamic models, hidden Markov models? Yes. I mean, because that's really So this right here, is. right, so this, this, is a, this is a data slide from some work of some colleagues of mine, not my work, um, and they were doing what's called a change detection task. So it's, you know, a, a kind of thing that comes up in like switching column filters or other areas in engineering where basically you're, tr you're, you're, you're tracking some statistical process that's going on in the world and every so often it changes, though the changes are unobserved to you. You, or rather, you don't directly observe the change points, you just see, well, now some other things are happening. And people are asked to figure out where the change points happen, or else to just make predictions that robustly respond to these hidden change points. So for people who know about these Markov models, that's a, that's a standard use of those kinds of models. And this is just showing basically some fits to data that, that it, a kind of a, a particle filter in one of these sort of switching Kalman filter type models, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not a linear Gaussian thing, so it's not exactly a Kalman filter, but it's like a Kalman filter with a discrete switching state uh, provides a very good account of people's behavior there. Uh, basically, I mean, the, the task is just, people are wondering, it's, it's, this is sort of shown here. Basically, you're, imagine that you are watching, it's like a, like a, I don't know, a chinko machine or something like that. Little disks are coming down in various columns, and there's some underlying process that sort of spits them down kind of over here, or maybe it spits them down over here noisily, and you just see where they come down. So you're seeing things come like burp, burp, burp over here, and then a little bit later, now they're suddenly coming over here, but now they're coming here. And basically, this underlying hidden thing has moved around, and you have to figure out kind of when it moves. That's the task. And there's various things like that in the real world, right? Like, how do we figure out when some, yeah, tra yeah tracking things where there's discrete, unobserved changes of state. So that's a, a classic engineering problem. And it turns out that the same kinds of models developed in engineering to solve that problem describe human behavior well. Okay? Um, now, this over here is some work from a, a junior colleague of mine, Vikash Mansinga who I almost brought down with me from Boston today, because really, he, he and some of his colleagues are doing some of the most exciting, interesting math that brings all these ideas together. Um, this is from his, his PhD thesis called something like Natively Stochastic Computation, where he articulated an engineering version of this whole stack, how you could take, he showed with various colleagues, how you could take any probabilistic graphical model, probabilistic graphical model and um, come up with very general approximate inference Monte Carlo schemes that could be compiled down into digital circuits, but not deterministic digital circuits, stochastic circuits, sort of intrinsically noisy circuits that have a certain kind of brain-like character to them. But what they do, though, is they implement in a very efficient, both sort of um, rapid time efficient and also metabolically or energetically efficient way, uh, approximate probabilistic inference. So this basically is a scheme here for taking the conditional distributions you need to implement Gibbs sampling. It's a kind of Markov chain Monte Carlo, and then compiling that into a, a special kind of stochastic digital circuit that supports parallelism, or rather, it can, can, if there is parallelism to be exploited, it can exploit it. Um, it's all silicon stuff. It's not actual wet neuroscience, but it provides at least an existence proof and develops some very interesting math. This is, this is just a little overview of some of his work. I'll just say, you know, invite him down or talk to him or read his thesis or whatever. But it's very cool math, which, it, which, which shows at least how you could take probability and this view of probabilistic computation and bring it all the way down to circuits. Um, this is the, the one other thing I was going to show on this case study. I said that there's evidence that people actually do this kind of um, something like a kind of approximate sampling based inference. If you go back to that prediction task that I showed you, this is one of the subtleties I said I would talk about later. Um, remember on the, on the prediction task what I plotted there was the posterior median, so the, the median of the Bayesian posterior against the median of a large group of subjects. But what if you look at the other quantiles, you know, the 10% 10, 10 or 20% quantile? You know, there's distribution in what people do, and there's distribution in the Bayesian posterior. And it turns out that they're almost identical. 
So that's what's shown here. We're applying 5, 10, 15, 20 percent percentiles of these two distributions against each other. This one over here is the Bayesian posterior distribution. This one over here is the human distribution of human responses. And what this is showing is that it, it, it looks as if the, the distribution of individual judgments that different people make looks just like the distribution of the, of the Bayesian prediction, as if individual people have roughly similar knowledge about the world, but their particular guess on each moment is just a single sample from the distribution. This yeah. is cross-subject. Yes, yeah, this is cross-subject. Cross yes, yeah, so Tom Griffiths, who, who did this work then in his lab later on, ha has done an individual difference version of this with a really cool method that, that's called, that he calls human MCMC. And I won't, I won't tell you any of the details except that you should totally look it up because it's very cool. But basically, he showed a way to get lots and lots of samples from one individual subject, and he replicated the same basic phenomenon. So check out that one. What, what wouldn't look like sampling? I'm kind of inclined to believe so, but What wouldn't look like sampling? Well, so if, first of all, everybody can say the same thing, or the distribution of what people say, like it could have the same medium, but it could be different in all sorts of other ways. Right, so for example, the distribution of, of variation in, in you know, subject responses could be due to anything. It could be due to noise and attention, and surely there is some of that in there, right? Um, it could be due to, yeah, all, any, any sort of thing. Maybe there, some people are rushing through the task and other people are taking their time. Um, but in this case, and, and, and a number of other uh, things, there's a paper that Ed Gould and I and Tom and others wrote, um, which the next slide refers to, in which we looked at various different uh, problems, not just this, but also ones in concept <coughs> learning and perception, and it looks as if across a number of different domains, individual, there's, there's a remarkable, striking uh, similarity between the distribution of subject responses and the and Bayesian posterior predictions. The, the, this is just an, one other kind of piece of new math that in a sense comes from this. It's, I wouldn't say this is, this is not sophisticated math. We just did some simulations and I think there's room for a lot more interesting analysis here. But, this paper by Gould et al., that's, and I'm one of the alls, um, we, we were trying to understand this kind of behavior here, which is it seems like people are taking a single sample. If you know, if you know anything about sampling-based approximate inference in machine learning or statistics, you, you know, typically one works very hard to get not just a single sample, but to get a lot of samples to really map out a posterior. Whereas it seems like people are often making decisions from just one sample. And we, we did a simple mathematical analysis to try to understand what, why people might be doing that, where we said, well, you know, suppose there's some space or time cost for drawing samples, right? Like, you know, in, in samplers like particle filter, there's a kind of a space cost. You need more and more particles. In MCMC or Markov chain Monte Carlo, it's more of a time cost. You have to wait longer to get more samples. And it's roughly linear in cost in the number of samples, roughly. Um, but there's a strong law of diminishing returns, which is shown here. This, here what we're doing is we're just looking at a, at a two alternative choice task, but you can do the same thing for n way choices or continuous choices. And just say, well, how much value do you get in drawing additional samples? Um, so, sort of, what, how, what, what is your, you know, there's different ways to quantify this, and I won't go into the details, but basically, um, how, you know, if, if you don't draw any samples, so you're just completely in the dark, then you're at 0.5, which means your sort of probability of, it's, it's, sort of complicated, so I won't say exactly what that point five means, but basically you don't know anything. When you get one sample, you gain, you get a lot. And of course, the more samples you get, well, you're, you're getting closer to your, um, you know, to, to the best you could possibly do. This is a noisy task, which is why the best you could possibly do is still 0.75. Um, even if you have the distribution perfectly, you know, if, if let's say it's, uh, you know, if, 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 if that means you've, you've totally mapped out the weight of some coin, but if the coin is anything other than zero or one weight, you still can't be guaranteed of getting it right, even if you know it's a weight of 75% heads, you know, you're only going to be right 75% of the time. That's why this thing peaks up at 75% there. Um, so there's a very strong diminishing returns of extra samples, and if you just do a little expected utility analysis, you can say, well, how much is it worthwhile to draw more samples compared to other things I could do, like go on to solve other problems? Then in many cases, you have this, what we call this one and done result, where actually the optimal number of samples is one. One sample buys you a lot, but thinking harder, longer, doesn't pay off. It's better to just make a decision and move on to the next thing where you could gain some reward. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking practically, it depends on your task. So exactly. suppose I want to track an amoeba. Yes. So if I want to track exactly, so the shape is changing constantly, so then I have to sample from an infinite dimensional um, set of curves, right? Oh, yes. Uh, infinite, infinite dimensional observers are hard to do. 
But suppose they want to shoot the Amiga with a Predator drone or something, mm -hmm. they just have to track the centroid. Yes. Okay, so it could just be simple translation, and yes. they have a very small sample space. Yes, so it's really very much task. Oh, related. totally, yes. I mean, and, and the task where, you know, these techniques were originally developed, like, for nuclear weapons design or various kinds of statistical data analysis, real big, heavy, expensive matters of many people's lives and deaths, right? Then it pays. <laughs> but in the, ta the task where, you know, I think online neural computation is mostly about, well, you know, should I go there or should I go there or should I do this or should I do that? It's not usually a matter of life and death. You know, I'm trying to decide, should I forage in this patch, should I forage in that patch, should I hunt in this canyon or whatever. Um, but you, you can certainly take the same analysis and consider what you might think of as kind of black swan cases. Again, ones where people's decision making is not often not very uh, optimal, right? If you have a low probability but high cost outcome, then you shouldn't take one sample. <laughs> you should take a lot of samples, because otherwise you're probably going to miss it, and it's going to really matter that you missed it. Um, so you could say, I mean, and this paper speculates, that might be a, a, you know, a cost. Of, if, if our brains are optimized for the setting where we have to make a lot of decisions quickly because no one of them really matters very much, then there are going to be some cost, which is we're going to get those cases wrong. All right. I think I'm almost out of time, which is, I don't know, a little bit too bad, because I only did one case study, but it's the best one, and it's the one that's most developed. I don't, I don't know if how the time works here. I could, I could briefly summarize what I didn't get to talk about, or uh, what do you guys want? Um, I'll tell you, yeah, I have to uh, deconstruct the mythology at least. Yeah. Five, more minutes. Five minutes, that's no problem. Because <laughs> um, really, like 95% of the success was on this case study um, in, in our field. Then we can continue yeah. yeah, okay. So what's missing from this? Well, <laughs> you know, as I sort of gestured at when, in responding to Gary, Bayesian networks, graphical models can't actually accommodate most of these kinds of things because to really do this kind of very flexible reasoning, you can't just have a finite fixed set of random variables. No fixed graph is going to do it. You need something that looks more like a, a, what's, what people call a language of thought. right? You need some way of defining probabilities over representations which are computationally universal, namely representations in which you can assign a probability to any thought you can think, because that's really what we're showing here. Is these are you know, any thought you can think, you can assign some probability to or, or say oh, that's a better guess or a worse guess. That's going to take us back to the sort of symbolic era of computation, the, the lambda calculus and Lisp ideas. Um, or another, another key motivation, which is really what a lot of our works, our group's ongoing current work is about, is what we call the common sense core. This is an idea that has emerged not in, um, in the sort of math or engineering side, but in experimental psychology and different areas of cognitive science and also neuroscience, that the, 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 something about the heart of human intelligence, that what develops earliest in infancy, what's, what's shared in, in important ways with other species, although then develops in some more sophisticated uh, ways distinctively in humans, is a basic understanding of the world in terms of what we could call intuitive physics and intuitive psychology. Physical objects, intentional agents, like agents like people, but others that have mental states, beliefs and desires that guide their actions. And the interaction between these things, how one physical object interacts with another, like you know, force dynamics, or how intentional agents interact with objects or with each other. That it's knowledge about these kinds of things that is really the heart of human intelligence. This is the kind of thing that, you know, to cite an important Simon's initiative at MIT, you know, we've got, we've, we had uh, Simon's support for autism research and then more generally the social brain. Why is, why is the foundation interested in the social brain? Why are people at MIT interested in it? It's because this is absolute, this kind of thing is absolutely central to how the human mind works, what the human brain has evolved to do, and we want to understand both how it works in the normal case and how it can go wrong and what can be done about it. So there's lots of motivation to try to understand this, and not just phenomenologically, but with you know, real reverse engineering quantitative models. That, that's what I've most wanted to do in my career, and it's only now that we're really understanding how to do that. We, we, we can't do it using the toolkit of graphical models as standardly received, because again, we need, just like I was gesturing at with those medical diagnosis cases, we need the ability to define probabilities not over a fixed set of finite random variable, but over something that's much more like a program. So let me, since I don't have much time, I don't know, how can I, best illustrate this, I think I'll skip my little hydro and symbol videos here and just say these kinds of things. Like, you could look at a scene like this, this is, a, this is a real world intuitive physics. You can look at this workshop scene and see what's supporting what, what is stable, what is precarious, like that tire is a little bit precarious, if you knock the table it might fall over, what's attached to what, those things on the wall back there are actually attached. Um, 
Or, you know, if you look at that stack of dishes over there at my local coffee shop and you see it's an accident waiting to happen, right? You know if you were going to pick that up, you'd have to first rearrange those things, otherwise the china is going to go all over the floor and break. Or you look at these scenes of people here, and in a glance you can perceive certain things about what they want, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, just from these images. So it's that, it's that kind of thing that we want to get at. And if we want to say, how can we build probabilistic models to do that, to, to do that kind of scene understanding, kind of common sense scene understanding, well, here are some just sketches of these, and I'll just have time, I guess, to show you the sketches and a little bit of what we're doing with them. Um, here's a sketch of, for those of you who know hidden Markov models, this is, in some sense, a hidden Markov model. Um, it's, it's a model that describes, in some abstract form, physics. It says, there's a world state out there, you know, three-dimensional objects in the world, and there's two kinds of causal arrows. One, which you could call physics, which explains how the world state evolves in time. Another, which you could call graphics by analogy to computer graphics, which explains how the three-dimensional world renders into an image that, you, that you, is the thing you actually perceive, this two-dimensional image. And what we're doing in these kinds of scenes is we're observing one or sequences of these images, and then somehow working backwards, or running something like a graphics program backwards, that's a way to describe vision, basically, to figure out the world state. And then when we make inferences about what's stably supported or precarious or attached, we're basically doing some kind of inferences over this physics error. We're making predictions of what would happen if we wait a little bit, or we bump this, or we try to lift this up. And if we want to make probabilistic inferences, the kind of things that all the rest of our field has found is, is what's necessary for making useful quantitative models or robust working AI systems, we need ways of defining probabilistic models over these kinds of, of, um, of things. And it's not, it's, it's not, I mean, you can draw a little graph like this, but all the work is not done by the graph. It's done by the math of how physics works and how graphics works. It's the reason why at Pixar, when they want to make a movie, and by the way, this is actually a computer graphics thing, they don't use graphs, they use computer programs, right? The way we capture the knowledge of graphics is with a computer program. And for those of you, you know, like, who do physical simulation, right? The way physicists describe complex systems is, well, with math equations and then often computer programs. If you can't solve those equations analytically for a, a big complex system, you have to do simulation. And we think the brain has to do the same kind of thing, basically, probabilistic simulation of programs. And the, yeah. Uh, but of course, I mean, the arrow going backwards is hardly, it's not a well-defined problem. Well, that's why you have to be Bayesian. Right? Uh, no, it, it's, it's exactly what I mean. And when you're talking about pictures, I mean, one thing yeah. I'd like to say is that when you see water flowing, you're seeing the picture of water flowing. You're not seeing the number of those equations. It's a right. picture that you're seeing. I mean, when you see, let's say, a perfect storm, and yeah. you see water flowing, yeah. it's yeah. a picture of it. And you're right. aware that the water is flowing, the water is flowing. You don't right. get any complex differential equations. Right. Well, so, so that's, that's exactly the open question that we're now trying to understand. And basically what we're trying to do is build probabilistic models of intuitive physics and also intuitive psychology where the, the thing that the problems are defined over are programs. Basically things actually, so, so pro programs for graphics or physics or for psychology, they're planning algorithms. So again, this is the work that we are doing that's most relevant to the Simons Center for the Social Brain is we're building these reverse engineering models of intuitive psychology which says, that at the heart is some kind of a program, and at the heart of your understanding of an intentional agent, you know, another person, or, or an animal, or, or whoever, is a program for planning. That's what robotics people just call the process of having a model of the world, having some desires or utilities, and then producing a sequence of actions. So, you know, that, that's, what, that's what you do in robotics, is you, maybe you have a map, you have some utilities or goals, and then planning algorithms maybe find the shortest, most efficient path for wherever the robot's current state is to where it wants to get to. In a sense, what we're saying is maybe the same way you might do intuitive physics by having sort of probabilistic physics engines in your head, you might do intuitive psychology by doing a kind of probabilistic robotics, right? You think of other people as sort of sophisticated robots, not mechanical things that always do the same thing, but agents that have a model, that have a goal, and do some efficient, effective action to achieve their goal given their model of the world. And if you make that a probabilistic planning algorithm, then you can do a kind of Bayesian inference to run that arrow backwards to observe the outputs of that function and make guesses about the inputs. That's, you know, that's, that's I would say, um, one of our big frontiers right now is how to get that to work. And I don't, I don't have time, and I you know, was rather ambitious, but I have about 20 or 30 really wonderfully beautiful slides <laughs> showing how we can actually make quantitative models of these common sense intuitive physics and psychology domains like that. We haven't actually published much of this work yet, but um, it's just about you know, to be submitted in various ways, and there's some conference papers, so I'm happy to refer you to it if, if you're interested. It, we can relate it to, um, 
infants even. Like, simple versions of these models have been used to predict infants' looking time, and thus to build actually some of the first quantitatively predictive models of, of infant cognition. Um, and we can apply these, these same kinds of things to these very simple kinds of intuitive psychology settings where you know, an agent is basically, people observe an agent moving around in a simple room and you have to say, well, is his goal A, B, or C as a function of how he moves, where A, B, and C are, where, um, where this, uh, you know, what kind of obstacles, what, uh, how far he's moved along his path. And, the, you know, and these models can make very quantitatively precise predictions. This here is this people's judgments about whether an agent's goal is A, B, or C across many different of these scenarios. And here's what these models do. The models are actually very simple as mathematical models. There's very few free parameters. The parameters that are there are interpretable and measurable. Unlike, say, sort of a black box machine learning algorithm, right? It's just this idea that you just assume the agent tries to plan its most efficient route to its goal, and then you just say, what goal would best explain it? We can apply these to settings which are basically classic theory of mind, false belief type settings, which I won't, um, I won't really uh, dwell on, we can apply them to these so-called multi-agent settings where we're trying to understand how people infer that another agent is helping or hindering another agent. There was, a, there was a, there's some great work that came out of the labs of Karen Wynn and Paul Bloom at Yale, done by their junior colleagues uh, Val Kuhlmeier and Kylie Hamlin, and we've been working with Kylie to try to make sense of some very interesting phenomena. Even very young infants can perceive an agent as helping or hindering another agent. And she has work suggesting that it's not just some low-level inference of, uh, you know, based on, say, how things move, but actually requires a mentalistic understanding that, in some sense, uh, to help and for one agent to help another is, to, is for this agent to take as its utility function the ex its expected utility of the other agents. Uh, expected utility, basically. But it's sort of like the golden rule, right? What should you do if you're a good person? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, you can formalize that with a kind of recursive probabilistic program and actually make that into a quantitatively predictive model of both uh, adult and child social inferences. So uh, that's very exciting. And there's math behind this, which, again, I would just point you to my junior colleagues uh, like Prakash Singha, Cameron Freer, and Dan Roy, who've taken this idea of these probabilistic programs, and along with a number of others, basically taken a lot of some of the basic kinds of questions in the theory of computation, including computability, when is a distribution or a conditional inference computable, and complexity results. And it's, they're just at the earliest stages of this. But it's a very exciting place where the same, the kind, the same kind of richness of theoretical computer science that, has, that was long developed in the deterministic setting now can be done in the probabilistic setting. And a lot of things actually come out to be even more interesting than the deterministic setting. Um, I should, I, I know I should wrap up. OK, I'll wrap up. Um, so I told you about one big successful case study, one sort of emerging one. The thing that's most open is how, to, how we know, we, we, if we, under, we understand probability as something which can bridge all the way down from the mind to the brain. To actually get common sense in the mind right, you need to combine probability with logic. But then there's the, the obvious missing link is how do we get logic or probabilistic logic or probabilistic programs down into the mind? And the shorter answer is, the short answer is that nobody has a clue. But some of the very smartest people in our field have um, some either impenetrable or, or silly ideas. <laughs> um, Paul Smolensky has some very deep but ideas about, say, for example, tensor products, um, how these might be ways of taking neural vector spaces and representing um, structured things. Uh, Jeff Hinton has some interesting kind of nonlinear dynamical systems, which might be able to model things kind of like intuitive physics. But really, it's, it's wide open. And what, what we really have to get at here is if we, if th this is just a survey from recent computational neuroscience papers, where what the way the field of computational neuroscience has, has defined itself is, is way too much what I would call, or we, on the engineering side, call electrical engineering. Right? These are the terms, for those of you who, who are in neuroscience or you know, go to a engage with computational neuroscientists on a regular basis. This is the theoretical vocabulary of the field as it comes into contact with experimental systems neuroscience. is basically the math of electrical engineering, and hardly at all the math of uh, computer science. But if we want to understand how things like programs can be implemented in the brain, we need to have computational neuroscience basically look more like this, and not just like that. So, that, so that's, that's the end. I'll just say, to, to sum up then, 
this long history of a very productive bidirectional interchange between math and science, which we have hundreds of years of success in the physical sciences, is alive and well not only in biology, but in the cognitive neurosciences. And I'd say it's one of the most actually exciting active areas where math and science are, are going, P partly because the math here is so central in actually getting at the heart of the phenomena. If we're going to reduce the mind to the brain or understand how a mind is produced by or implanted in the brain, I think it's the kind of math that we're talking about here that's going to be absolutely at the heart of that. And we gave these, these sort of two and a half case studies here, right? Probabilistic inference as being the basic glue between the mind and the brain that we know works. This idea of these probabilistic programs coming back to and really putting symbolic, logical, uh, un computation universal expressions at the heart of our probabilistic models that's going to be necessary for common sense. But then it raises this, this question of how those computation universal languages might work in the brain. I'd say that's the biggest open question for the, you know, what I call the 21st century mind-body problem, is understanding how those symbols work in the brain. Together with probability, that's, that's what we need to do. Okay, thanks for your patience. Sorry.